Now, Patrick Moore investigates the dubious history of the telescope in the sky at night. Good evening. I am sure that you must have used a telescope at some time or other. Now, astronomical telescopes come in two kinds. First of all, we have refractors. And here is a refractor, in fact, the very first telescope I ever had, a long time ago. And it collects its light by means of a glass lens or object glass. And this one has an object glass three inches across. And this is how it works. The light, from whatever you're looking at, comes in, passes through the lens, is bunched up and brought to focus when it's magnified by a second lens known as an eyepiece. Now, the first refractor of which we have definite knowledge was built by a Dutchman. His name was Lippershey and he made a refractor in the year 1608. But one of the first men to apply it to the sky, not the very first actually, but one of the first, was the great Italian astronomer Galileo. And he made a telescope for himself. And here are some very early telescopes. Uh, Galileo's is the top one. And the most powerful telescope he ever made, magnified 30 times. But in the winter of 1610, he used his very first telescope to make a series of spectacular discoveries and published them uh, in a small book. He discovered the craters of the moon, the moons of Jupiter, the phases of Venus, the myriad stars of the Milky Way, and really revolutionized astronomy. And that reinforced his already strongly held view that the Earth really does go around the sun and not the other way around. But those early refractors were in some respects unsatisfactory. For reasons we needn't go into now, the first were made with very long tubes, or what passed for tubes. Look, for example, at this one, <laughs> most cumbersome looking thing. Those are circles, they're not lenses, they're part of the construction. And in some cases, the object glass actually had to be fixed to a mast. And these things must have been incredibly awkward to use. I always find it amazing that the ancients find out how much they did with them. Well, we have far better refractors now. The world's largest refractor is at the Yerkes Observatory in America. There's the dome, and there is the great 40-inch refractor, which is a superb telescope, and I know because I've used it myself. But these days, uh, refractors have been very largely taken over by reflectors. And here is a reflecting telescope, a small one, I may say. And this one uh, has no lens. It collects its light by means of a curved mirror. And the light comes down the open tube, strikes the curved mirror, is reflected back onto a second mirror, or flat, and then sent into the side of the tube, where an image is formed and magnified as before. And that principle is known as the Newtonian, well, the first man to make a reflector of that kind, so far as we know, was Sir Isaac Newton. And in fact, the very first telescope he ever made is still in existence, and there it is, and the mirror is only one inch across. Newton wasn't actually the first to think out the reflector principle. It had been worked out some years earlier by the Scottish mathematician James Gregory. Now, Gregory never actually made a telescope. I may say Newton's were given to the Royal Society in 1671. Gregory's uh, work was about 1664. And his optical principle wasn't quite the same as Newton's. Once again, the light comes on an open tube, hits the curved mirror, is reflected back onto a curved secondary this time, and then back to the observer through a hole in the main mirror, where the light rays are bunched up, an image is formed, and magnified by an eyepiece as before. Well, there we have the first telescope that the history books tell us about. Newton's refractor, 1671. Lippershey's refractor, 1608. But now there's very strong evidence that telescopes were known a long time before that and that the invention was almost certainly English. And the man who's done all the research here is Colin Ronan. Colin, welcome back to the sky at night. Thank you, Patrick. First of all, what originally made you think that telescopes were invented long before Newton and long before Galileo and Lippershey? Well, when Lippershey uh, applied for uh, or told the Dutch government that, he wanted, that he'd made this invention, this was in October 1608, but within two weeks, two other spectacle makers besides him had also made equal claims, and it seemed to me that the only answer was that there was some common ancestor to these telescopes. Well, that makes sense. Um, how did you start finding out? Well, I went back in history, and I found that some historians had once thought that Leonard and Thomas Diggs had invented and built such a telescope. So um, I decided to look again because nobody had made a war out a watertight case. Leonard and Thomas Diggs. Diggs or Diggies, do we know? We don't know. We'll call them Diggs. All right. Right, Leonard and Thomas Diggs. Tell us about them. 
Well, Leonard Diggs was born in 1520 and died 1559. He was a man who, I quote, devoted himself to scientific pursuits. He was a well-to-do landowner in Kent, and all the only uh, he, he did scientific pursuits. He also wrote a famous book called Prognostications Everlasting, which was a perpetual calendar with astronomical, meteorological, and other information. The one great fault he made was that he supported Thomas Wyatt's rebellion. That sounds a bit risky. Yes, it was in the time of Queen Mary the yes. First, Bloody Mary, exactly. and of course it failed. Yeah. Wyatt was beheaded, and Leonard Diggs was condemned to death, but he was reprieved and actually ha had his estates uh, confiscated and spent years getting them back. Uh, that was in... Uh, he died soon, year, soon after in 1559. But the point is that his son Thomas, who was about 13 when he died, was a better mathematician probably than uh, Leonard. He was certainly a very fine mm -hmm. surveyor. He was about 13 when his father died and was brought up in the right circles by John Dee, who was one of Queen Elizabeth's advisors. He became an MP, which in those days was a public duty. You didn't so, get paid for it. And also, he was muster master general to the um, British forces in the Low Countries. Now, amongst other things that he also did was that in 1571, he produced a book called Pantometria. Now, this was really written by his father. This is an actual copy. This is an actual copy that comes from the Royal Astronomical Society, very kindly. It's actually bound in with another book. It has a lovely, a beautiful title page in colour, which refers, and this is important and took me, to buy to perspective glasses. Now, this seems to have been a term used for telescopes in the early days. And later on in the book, I've turned on a couple of pages, uh, we find that he does speak of his father's work, which was experimental and mathematical, and says that he had a device for seeing at a distance. Indeed, it looks jo sounds jolly like a reflecting telescope with a lens and a mirror. But he wrote in terms not familiar today. What do you really need a telescope for? Ah, well, in those days, it was really for military and naval use. And indeed, in the book, uh, Thomas Diggs says that he's going to write a book about, uh, about all this. But interestingly, his claim, when he says that, fired the government's imagination. And Lord Burley, the chief advisor to Queen Elizabeth, called for a report on whether this claim by the Diggses was true. And he called on a man called William Bourne, mm -hmm. who was an expert in military and naval matters. And uh, they were, after all, very afraid in England at that time that we were going to be invaded. The Armada was on they its were, way. They were indeed, yes. Mm. And so Bourne was commissioned to write a report. And so he did. The Diggs book, by the way, never came out. I wonder why. Now, can it, if, since there's a military connection here, is it possible that it was deliberately suppressed from a kind of early D notice? Well, this could indeed be. We just don't know. We haven't enough information. We, uh, it may be amongst government papers, and people have never really looked into that. I seen. wonder whether it's possible. After all, it's just possible, you know, that somebody watching this program may have some information. An old manuscript, an old library. Uh, too much, I suppose, to find a portrait. We haven't even got portraits of the no. digs. I wonder, if anyone does have any information, then please let us know. Well, let's come back to Bur uh, uh, the report to Burley, because it was an extremely good report. It was written in a very beautiful, clear hand. And uh, in it, Bourne says that he and jo that John Dee and Thomas Diggs knew all about the telescope, all about perspective glasses. But on this last page of his report, he says, the trouble with this device for seeing things at a distance, its greatest impediment is that you cannot behold and see but the smaller quantity at a time. Now, that means the, machine, the instrument had a tiny field of view. And by golly, if you hadn't looked through a telescope, you wouldn't even have a concept of that, leave alone be able to say so. So, Bourne has certainly looked through a telescope. Had diggies. Diggs? Ah, oh, I think he had, because... Um, Diggies did another book. In 1576, he produced a book, a new edition of Prognostications Everlasting with a huge appendix. Now, this was 33 years after 
Nicholas Copernicus put forward the idea that the Sun was at the centre of the universe. And here is a facsimile of um, the manuscript of this book by Copernicus. And there is the Sun at the centre with the planets, including the Earth, going round. But there's one particular thing. Copernicus still held to the idea that there was a sphere of fixed stars. Thomas Diggs believed the universe was infinite. And he, in fact, in this book, produces this diagram, which is his own, and says that the stars extend outwards into space forever. He also not only does a diagram, he does text, and his text says that, in fact, the stars get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer until you can't see them because they're too dim. This is just the sort of description you'd make if you were looking through a telescope, just the sort of description Galileo made years later when he looked through a telescope. It all seems to fit, but um, of course, what kind of a telescope, some kind of reflector, you say, when does Bourne give any clue as to the design of the Diggs telescope? Oh, yes, he does. In 1578, he published a book called Inventions or Devices. And here is the title page, and you can clearly see the date, 1578, 30 years before Lippershey's claim. This is from a copy in the British Library. And in Device 110, which is spread across two pages, he says two vitally important things. To begin with, he says, for to see a small thing at great distances, it requireth the aid of two glasses. Now, this is the basic principle of the telescope. You must have two optical components, uh, two lenses, or a lens and a mirror. And this was stated in 1578. And that's a long time before Galileo. Yes. Well, also, he, um, he, it's a strange design. Um, it's a sort of cross between a refractor and a reflector. The light comes in through a lens and is brought together to a focus and then to a small curved mirror. And the curved mirror looks, uh, is, is used as an eyepiece. It's, it's a strange design indeed. It must be rather difficult to use. It is difficult to use, but you get the knack of it. And I can say this because, in fact, um, we have built one. And how long did that take you? Well, uh, I had the help of Gilbert Satterthwaite, who works at the um, optics section of Imperial College in London, who very generously gave me lab space to build a mo an optical model of this. Um, I followed Bourne's design. I was aided and abetted by a picture which, of it, which a German, Joachim Reinitz, had drawn up. Uh, he'd made, he tried it out with a shaving mirror and a lens. I did, I'd done the same. My lens wasn't as good as Reinitz, and I'd not got a very good result. But we actually put together a telescope, made all the measurements on it, and then Gilbert actually built one. And um, when you started building this telescope, you and Gilbert sat at the way, did you really think it was going to work? Well, theoretically, it should have worked. Reinitz's experiment and my own had made me think it would, but by golly, when it did, we were really excited. The first people to look through a telescope like this for over 400 years. Why do you think, why do you think that no one's tried it before? Oh, because it, the, the description by Bourne and indeed the description by Diggs are not in modern terms. And I think you want a experience in optics, uh, which both Gilbert and I have. And I think also uh, you've got to have faith that, there's really, that it's really worth following through. Well, before we go and look at it, just one point. We've been talking a great deal about Bourne. How do we know that this design really was Diggs and not Bourne's? Oh, because in the preface to... Uh, his book, Inventions or Devices, he says that not all the devices which he mentions are his own. And secondly, when he wrote to Burley, he said, I'm a poor man, I can't experiment, I can't do these things. So clearly he had gone to the Diggses to find out. And this clearly, I'm sure, is the design which the Diggses showed him at that time. Well, you and Gilbert have made the first Diggs-type telescope for over 450 years. You have it here. We would rather hope you put it outside and uh, mm -hmm. view things from there, but of course it's pretty bad weather today. And therefore what we've done is to set it up in a room upstairs, and we're going to use it and look through a window and just see what we can see with it. And this will demonstrate to everybody that the Diggs telescope really does work. So, Colin, let's go and try it out. Fine.
Well, and here we have the first Diggs telescope built for over four and a half centuries. Of course, it's got a, a plywood square box, and I imagine the Diggs telescope probably didn't actually look like that. Well, we don't know how it looked, Patrick. They may well have made it square. What we did was just put a box around it to keep out stray light, which is what you need with a telescope. After all... But the optics are right. After all, the only purpose of a, of a, of a box is to hold the optic in the correct position. That's it. And then, of course, there's the question of the mounting. Here we have a modern camera tripod, and I imagine the Dick wouldn't have had that. What kind of mounting would he have had, do you think? Well, I think he'd have probably had some sort of tripod, wooden one, they used, after all, surveying instruments and so on, so I think he would have had something like that, probably so that you could move it sideways and up and down, because that's what you wanted to do. You certainly couldn't just hold it. It'd be far too awkward for that. Oh, I think it'd be far too awkward, and you'd want to be able to... But it would have to be small enough to be able to be taken about so that you can go in forests high up and look down on the enemy and things like that. Well, I had my first look through it a few moments ago, and I was surprised how sharp the image was. Now, let's now show those who are watching us now, but, of course, we can't expect the camera view to be as good as the view you actually get visually. It wasn't made for that. No, 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 no. They had no idea of photography, leave alone television. Yes, I don't think it, I wonder what Diggs would have thought if he knew that four and a half centuries later, he, one of his t t telescopes typed would have been used for television. He couldn't have known. Now, uh, can you tell us exactly what we're seeing, Colin? Well, what we're seeing is a church spire over in the distance, and it's got um, some bands across it. These are of lighter masonry. And the magnification is about 11 times. And you can see them quite clearly, in spite of the fact that we are looking through a window, for one thing, which is practically blowing a gale outside, and we have to, have to observe from indoors. Yes, and when you look through a window, you'll get distortions, so this is not, not the ideal situation. Do you think the views we're getting are comparable with the views he would have got with his telescope so long ago? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. Um, I think we've got a slightly better mirror than he would have had. I think the lens is perhaps a wee bit better. But this is the kind of image that he would have seen. Remember, the eye does compensate for things which the camera won't do. And, of course, the image we saw on the screen is upside down. Yes. Well, in order to get it, um, in order to get it the right way up, instead of looking through here, you'd want this tilted up here, and then you would look, excuse me, down in this sort of fashion. And you get an upright image. Well, you did that this morning. I did indeed, and I must say the view I have is remarkably clear. Mm. Now, can you take us through the various bits of the telescope? Yes, yeah, sure. Let's take off the lid, because we've made it so you can have a look inside. If I tilt it over, then everybody can see inside. There's the lens here. It brings the light together, and it's reflected off this curved mirror out the side of the tube, so you look in, and it has no eyepiece. It does away with extra surfaces, and that's a good thing. I wonder why it wasn't developed for so long after Dick's time. Well, my own guess is that probably they did change this mirror into a concave lens to see what would happen, and they would then have the Dutch telescope. And remember, Diggs went over to Holland, possibly to... Uh, Gregory thought he could get away with all... Uh, without the optical troubles by getting the mirror square, so he used a concave mirror, and then, of course, he'd want a concave mirror here, and you'd get the Gregorian telescope. Well, it's all very interesting, and if, in fact, Diggs did have a telescope long before Newton, long before Galileo, it's going to be in rewriting the history books, and it's going to cause a great deal of discussion. Colin, thank you very much. When I come back next month, I'm going way out beyond the solar system, I'm going to talk about the Andromeda galaxy. Meanwhile, if you want the latest information, dial the Sky at Night information line, 0898 or, of course, dial CFAX page 626. And so, until next month, good night. Sky at Night will be repeated on Saturday at 4.35 on BBC Two.